some issues? Well, hey, my first algebra class, I struggled. I worked so hard. I had a very kind teacher that stayed after class and helped me day after day. That, he, this man was a saint. I think it took at least uh, a month and a half of this before the light flashed. And it was, oh, I get it. <laughs> and uh, that moment of insight carried me on. And, and from then on, I, I loved math. I, I, could, I could do it. Uh, so sometimes we have to work. Uh, good things may, be, uh, may re require a little effort. But mathematical modeling is a power tool of science. You can explain things from a formula, and then you're able to make predictions, figure stuff out. So that's an important thing. Occam's razor, or other people call this the principle of parsimony. So keep it simple is the uh, the main idea here, use the simplest explanation that does explain things. Now, I don't want an explanation that's so simple that it fails. It doesn't work. But I do want to use the simplest that works. So these I consider the power tools. And we use them all the time. Science is successful. One example, and then we'll move on. Reductionism, or reducing the complicated problem to a simpler problem. This example is actually why I decided to teach physics. I was a senior at a self-supporting school not, not too far from here. And I just uh, I took a physics class. I needed something. OK, let's try this. I didn't know what I was getting into. But it was fun to be able to, it was empowering to be able to figure stuff out. And this is a real example that I experienced. You have a complicated motion. Here's a bouncing ball on the screen. So it's bouncing, it's moving, it's moving down, bounces up, it's moving to the right. Complicated two-dimensional motion, right? It's moving to the right, it's also up and down, so that's two different directions. Well, we're going to do a simpler problem. We're going to reduce it to two simple problems. Watch. We will just treat the vertical motion and the horizontal motion separately. And this is, this is cool. This is power. Uh, if you imagine just the up-down motion of the ball, well, it was going fast, slower, 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 reaches a high point and comes back down. That would be this here. I probably have a, a laser pointer here. So that would be this part. And then the horizontal. Honestly, it's just constantly moving to the side. And that was like a thunderclap to my mind. You mean the ball is just staying above me if I throw the ball in the air and walk? Well, I'm walking while throw the, throwing the ball. It will stay above me. And so I tried this in the dorm, walking up and down the hall, trying to throw objects straight up for me. Now, for you, you'd see it make this parabola, such as is on the screen. But for me, it was just up and down, because I'm moving right under the ball. Uh, so we won't make any puns about being under the ball or on the ball. But um, it really helped me to see I can break this into simpler parts. That's a power tool. Well, for those who aren't scared of the math, that reduces to some simple math formulas. No tests tonight. But uh, fairly simple formulas that deal with the position x or the position y and the speeds in terms of time. So this method empowers us to figure stuff out. So I love science, but let's talk. Uh, let's, let's go on. Um, so sci the scientific method is supposed to use real world observations and then figure out patterns, and then I use my creativity to find the general rules that work. I consider possible explanations for them, and then I will test, I do experiments. Full disclosure, the experiments don't usually work for me that well. <laughs> In the lab, um, yeah, I feel pretty fortunate if I get within 20% of the right answer. Uh, the theory was always more my friend. But uh, you must test your theories and see if they work. And we will then eliminate the ones that don't work. 
So this is how science works. Uh, now, different people do different parts. That's fine. Some people just sit in a dark corner and think of theories. Some other people just stay in the lab and experiment and test things, and that's fine. But um, there are these different parts of the process. So now let's think of some of the limitations, because science is not the answer to everything. Some people think science is oh, it works, it's lovely, so it must be the answer to everything. I'll tell you, as a scientist, this isn't true. And in fact, it's not science to say science is the answer to everything. This is an underlying assumption. If science works so often, and it does, then I'm going to use it for everything, and I'm going to say, if you can't prove it to me scientifically, then I'm not going to believe it. That's not science to say that. That is what's called scientism. So all these isms, right? So scientism is my ultimate faith that science will give all the answers. Uh, frankly, that's unjustified. That's a leap of faith. So um, you will find some scientists who say this, but they're not saying it as a scientist. They're saying it as their philosophy of, of life. And, and they're, they are proponents of this scientism. It's a faith. It's not science. It's unsupported. I will, I will uh, argue tonight that it's false. We need more than science. There are limitations. So here's some examples. And I will take from history to show you not only the power of science, but also there are limitations. So when someone tells you, um, I lost my faith because I started doing science, or um, maybe you, you suspect that someone has, has lost their way. Well, it's not because of science. It's because of scientism, I'll, I'll say. There are limitations. Science itself is not in conflict with the Bible, and uh, we will look at what does a scientific uh, what does the worldview look like when we start from the Bible and do science well? Okay, so let's think what happens when I have a favorite theory and I do some tests and it turns out, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, what do I do? So human reactions vary widely. Let's consider some. One is I deny it. You know deniers. They just won't listen. I deny the observations that conflict with, with my view. I cling to my trusted theory. Well, that's, that's a, human, a human response. Another one is we'll say, yeah, I really need to modify the theory. And one way to do that is to give up certain key parts. And you say, well, maybe I was wrong. We might have to abandon some parts, and then we say, OK, now it works. Another is just replace the theory altogether. I'm sorry, we were wrong. Let's try again. Let's, let's develop a new explanation. Build a model from the ground up. There may be other options, but let's start with these, these three. So what science can and cannot say will become obvious as we think of the human reactions to these situations. Science and even my reason, my thinking, is not enough. It's inadequate. It does not guarantee truth. And we all want the truth, but this is, a, this is not a guarantee. OK, so science is tentative. It doesn't prove. It gives me possible answers. So we'll see this. Even human reason is inadequate. God made us able to think, but we are human. We are finite we will not have all the answers. So as we seek truth, let's be humble. Okay, here's some examples. Let's go back to the ancient Greeks, Aristotle, uh, 300 years before Christ. He has this model. He has this explanation. Well, he looks around and he says, I think the, the earth is the center of everything. Well, it was an idea that was common at the time. And there were some things that supported this. Have you ever dropped something and it falls to the ground? Well, this kind of fit with Aristotle's thinking. He said, earthly things, earthly matter, tries to go back to the earth. 
whether it's a rock or a ball or, he said, now heavenly things circle around. Earthly things fall to earth, heavenly things stay in the heavens. And by the way, the ancient Greeks thought that the circle was the most perfect of all geometric figures. So, oh, everything in the heavens is perfect. Everything on earth is earthly and yeah. So um, this was his view and as he looks out, he explains everything through these lenses, this, this idea. So the earth is the center. In fact, let's teach you a little Greek tonight. Geo means earth. Yeah, good. It's uh, from the Greek word geia, and we use that prefix uh, geo. And center, okay, yeah, that's, that's an English word. So uh, geocentric means earth at the center. That's our worldview back then. Well, there are some problems with this. So there's, in our history of science, we find some things that work with the model and some things that don't work, remember? So let's look at this. That the heavenly matter, we, we say, yeah, it stays up there, and I see every night, uh, every day, well, the sun rises, the moon rises, the stars rise and set. Every, yeah, it looks like they're circling. But there are some problems. Unexplained cycles the geocentric worldview is going to fail. And you didn't grow up thinking the Earth is the center, so you, you're not surprised by this failure. What sort of failures did they find? The wandering stars. In fact, the Greeks called them planetai, which just means those who wander. So, the wandering stars. They don't stay in constellations. They kind of move across the sky. Um, evenings, Lately, I've been seeing a bright star in the sky soon after the sun sets. It's the planet Venus. It's not a star. It's, it's, uh, the Greeks thought it was a star, but it doesn't stay put. It moves. So these are the wanderers. They had no explanation. Aristotle fails. So what happens? We have to tweak the model. We have to add some things. So sometimes the, the planets move faster than the fixed stars circling the Earth, and sometimes they move slower. There are there's some intervals where we have retrograde motion, you know, backing up, reverse. So the arrow shows um, the path of Mars, and then it's, it's crossing the constellations, and then uh, one night it sort of decides to back up for a, a few nights, and then it goes forward. That's complicated. Geocentric model failed but we're going to tweak it. Watch. So here's, here's our first example of disagreement. Human reaction, let's just ignore this, <laughs> deny it. Or maybe we have to modify it, or maybe we just start a new theory. Well, in this case, modification worked. And we have Claudius Ptolemy, I'll, I'll say it in English, Ptolemy, um, about 100 years after Christ, found an explanation that tweaked the geocentric explanation, the geocentric worldview, and worked. He can now predict where will Mars be every night, where Venus will be, where Jupiter will be, and so on. That's great. So his model is epicycles. An epicycle, also from the Greek, epi means on top of. So this is a cycle on a cycle. So we have one cycle, the the uh, big circle around the Earth. Remember, the Earth is the center here, and then the small cycles that go on top of it. You can get this same effect if you put a spot of paint on your bicycle wheel, and you see it go All right, so this is, the planet is on the epicycle, and as the, circ as the epicycle moves, also the planet on the epicycle moves. So it does this number. Here's an animation, and we're, showing um, the sun just going around the Earth. The sun is yellow spot, Earth is a blue spot. But then Mars is doing something special, right? Mars is doing this epicycle number. Sometimes it's going faster, sometimes it's backing up. The second picture, the bottom right, you can see our angle at Mars sometimes crosses the sky and sometimes backs up. So, beautiful model. A little bit complicated, I'll tell you, but uh, 
it worked pretty well for over a thousand years, 1400 years. This was accepted as this is how the planets move. Well, uh, it worked. It gave good predictions. I'd call that a successful theory, successful model, extremely successful. I can go out every night and I know where to look, I'll find the planets. But it's wrong. We know it's wrong. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Uh, it was eventually replaced by a better theory, which we know of as the heliocentric model. So even though it worked for so long, it was wrong. Science is tentative. What I find is the best explanation today may be wrong and may be replaced later. Keep that in mind. It keeps us humble. Okay, so again, the reaction to conflict, the geocentric model just made the difference between earthly and heavenly stuff, and it did not explain the retrograde motion of the wandering planets. To modify it, we had to add the epicycles, and that's a complicated thing, but it did, it did work. It added some explanatory power at the expense of the complication. So the simpler theory, we're basically abandoning. We'll go with this more complicated version that works. And that's the model that lasted for 1,400 years and became like dogma. If you don't believe this, then you're, you're loony. And in fact, it was sort of so tied in with the, the, um, the Catholic faith that when Galileo came along and said, I, I don't think that's right, um, they forced him to recant. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So over a thousand years is not enough to prove a theory. It just means we didn't think of a better theory yet. Okay, so next case. We'll actually, we'll, we, will re we will replace the theory by a brand new one. Hold on. The heliocentric model is a brand new theory. The Earth is not the center with everything orbiting the Earth. Instead, helios is the center. What's helios? Anybody know? So helium, that's a related word. Excellent. It's the sun, yeah. This is the word for the sun. And the, why is the element helium named after the sun? It turns out that we first discovered helium in the atmosphere of the sun. We, by looking at the light from the sun and putting it through a prism, we said, oh, there's something weird going on here, something new we don't understand. And when they studied it more, they said, this is a new element. Eventually, we made our own helium, and we said, ah, it's a brand new element. Cool. So, uh, yeah, heliocentric is put the sun in the center and the Earth goes around it. Copernicus, interesting guy. A few years ago, I was in Warsaw in Poland and there was a big statue to Copernicus. He was Polish. He was a priest and he was nobody's dummy. He waited until he was on his deathbed to publish this book, which was going to make many people unhappy. So in the Latin, it's De Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium, which means about the revolutions of the heavenly spheres, the heavenly orbs. Well, he said, friends, the earth goes around the sun, not the sun around the earth. And he got rid of the epicycles. Turned out to be much simpler. Let's look. So, like I said, he waited till he was dying, and by the time it was published and there was a big uproar, um, he, was, he was out of the picture. No, no danger to him. Okay, so retrograde motion turns out to just be because a we are on a moving planet and we're watching a moving planet. That's all. No epicycles, no complications. So, look at the image. Again, the blue is the Earth, but now we're going around the sun. The red is going to be Mars. Mars is going around the sun. And from our point of view, sometimes Mars goes ahead, and sometimes we're catching up, and we see Mars fall behind. Pretty simple, right? Um, nobody realized before Copernicus, but uh, this was with simpler circles, an explanation for the complicated behavior. I'm sure that 
all of us have ha had the experience, uh, say you're, you're in a car, you're waiting for the light to change, and you suddenly get the feeling that, Am I, are we rolling? And you realize, no, it's the car next to us that's moving, right? So motion is relative. What I feel, am I going backwards or is that car going forwards? Well, from our moving earth, sometimes, you look at the line on the image right here, sometimes from our point of view, Mars crosses in front of us and sometimes we're catching up and we see Mars falling behind. And so it perfectly explains the uh, retrograde motion. Very slick. I love it when a plan comes together. Uh, okay, so viewing one planet from another moving planet, it works. And it actually did better than the old theory. It was simpler and it explains more. Now, a scientist will also tell you it's more elegant. I have a hard time defining this word elegance in the, in the context of science, but it, it's a theory that just, oh wow, that's beautiful, mathematically simple and powerful, and uh, we didn't put in a lot of extra complications in it, uh, so more elegant, we'll just say that. And it actually predicted more. That's a win. Okay, it gives us deeper understanding of the universe which is the goal in studying the universe. Come to Galileo, and he signed on to Copernicus's model. He said, you know, this makes sense. In fact, Galileo is sometimes considered the founder of science. He wrote a book, he said, um, discussions about two sciences, and he meant theory and experiment. Well, I told you already, uh, I have my leaning towards the theory side, but uh, we need both, so Galileo, in a sense, put both of those on our map, founder. He used the concept of inertia to explain all motion and forces, dynamics. It actually led to relativity, which is my area. Eventually, it, it led us to saying, well, your point of view, watching, you, you see that you're at rest and I'm moving. I see that you're moving, I see that I'm just hanging out and you're moving. Equally good, equally good views. So uh, motion is relative to who says. Galileo trained his telescope on the heavens and he was the first one to discover so many things. He was the first one to see that the moon has craters. He was the first one to see that the sun is not a perfect sphere of light. It has sunspots and he made pictures, he drew pictures of the sunspots moving across the sun. This blows their minds, and they didn't like it. <laughs> also, he saw the phases of Venus. The left picture here, please notice it looks sort of like the moon at different times of the month, but this is the planet Venus through a telescope. Sometimes it looks just like a crescent, and sometimes it looks bigger. And another thing, the crescent is big, and the more than crescent is small. That turns out to be important. The second picture explains why. If Venus is going around the sun, not the Earth, then from our point of view, sometimes we see the lit side, and sometimes we see more of the back side, more of a crescent. When, do we ha when does that happen? We see the crescent when it's on our side, when it's close, we see the more full Venus when it's on the far side. It's farther away from us, and the sun is shining on the same side we see. Oh, geocentric model didn't explain that. Galileo says, ah, Copernicus is right. What else did he find? He found the moons of Jupiter. A few weeks ago, we had a telescope night at Southern, uh, Friday nights, we tend to, once a month, we'll bring out some scopes. This is the planet Jupiter through a telescope, and see these four stars? Galileo was the first one to see those. They're not stars, they're moons, and they orbit Jupiter. Very cool. Here's a zoomed in uh, flyby picture, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. They're called today even the Galilean moons because he was the first one to see them. Now wait a minute, this means something orbits Jupiter, not the Earth. This gives 
anything can orbit anything. So it gives extra uh, validity to the idea that the Earth is not the center. So Galileo says, yes, um, Copernicus was right. And they, they called him up to trial, and they, uh, they said, you must uh, recant your beliefs. Well, sometimes people don't want to listen to reason, but also Galileo had a very abrasive personality. So uh, a lot of it was just because the Pope thought that Galileo was making fun of him. So that's not good. Uh, but anyway, new observational data may help us realize that we have to make a decision, deny the observations, modify the theory, or replace it. And it turns out with Copernicus that they, they're replacing it. But the next step was just to modify it a little bit. Let's look at that. So, some of the experiments say, well, Copernicus is not really explaining things. What do we do? Along comes Johannes Kepler. He invented three laws, and my wife tells me I have to simplify this. The three laws talk about the shape of the orbit, the speed of the planet going around the orbit, and the period for one complete cycle. Three laws, three parts, and it works so well. Well, he had to say, the heavens are not filled with circles. The planets are going on ellipses, not circles. And the speed depends on where you are in your path. And the total period turns out to be, uh, if you've done Algebra 1, you recognize a straight line here has a formula y equals mx plus b. Well, <laughs> thank you. Very good. <laughs> we have an algebra scholar here. The slope of this line is 1. The intercept is 0. It crosses here at the origin. And this relates two things directly. It says, oh, as the r squared goes up, that's the, the cube, rather, the cube of the distance away from the sun, then also the period of one whole orbit, one year, goes up t squared relates to r cubed. Now, my private idea is Kepler tried a lot of things before he found this. Like, you'd first try t equals 1r, and that didn't work. And then you try t equals r squared, and that didn't work. He, he just kept trying, and he found something that worked. Well, that's a win. If you uh, keep trying until you get it, that's great. So, in only a, three rules, he explains so many things it's amazing, and he explains better than anyone before. But now, let me ask you, is that truth yet? Because the, the previous models worked very well for a long time. Kepler does better. And now we say, oh, congratulations, John, you have, Johan, you have, uh, you've now brought us to truth. Well, I don't know. Maybe there's a better answer that will come next. We cannot depend on human thought as the final arbiter of truth. The better model, well, that's good. And in this model, the Earth is not the center, just like Copernicus said. But the circle is not perfection either now. This is a change. By assuming very little, he explains much. That's what I like in science. That's the hallmark of a good theory. We come to arguably the greatest of all scientists of all time, Isaac Newton. Kepler used three laws to explain the orbits of the planets. Newton uses one thing to explain so, so, so much. Newton was an English mathematician and scientist. Uh, in those days, they didn't have the word scientist. He was a natural philosopher. He was also an amateur theologian. Newton himself said what he wrote about Theology was more important than what he wrote about science. And in a sense, I'd say he was right. What we, when we think about the creator, that's more important than the creation. Creation is a way to help us understand the creator and appreciate the creator, but it's not the end in itself. Newton, un unfortunately, was a bad theologian. Uh, he had some very strange ideas, so mm, we don't celebrate him for that. But for his science, um, he's probably about the greatest scientist of all time. 
He invented the laws of motion, the foundation of physics. He invented calculus in order to do his theories. Um, and most importantly for us, one law, this is the law of universal gravitation. Every two masses, M1, M2, attract each other. And it depends on the values. We multiply M1 times M2. We divide by the square of the distance between, and that's the force. This G is a constant of nature, so it explains everything. And it was immensely successful. And now we'll look at the first test to Newton's theory. It was an accidental discovery of a new planet. Sir William Herschel aimed his telescope at the sky and saw oh, this star seems to have moved. Well, we know it today as the first new planet discovered, the planet Uranus, but it confirms Newton's law, or Kepler's three laws, both. It, it confirms the theory. It doesn't prove it, but it's good confirmation. So this is good. And um, again, a, a accidental discovery, take advantage of it. Does, it. does it agree with the theory or not? Let's talk. Well, history repeats itself. We found more and more problems as we did our tests, our observations more and more carefully. So again, the, the orbit of this new planet did not seem to exactly follow what Newton would have said. This is long after Newton's time, but we found little problems coming in. So what, did he, what do you do? Well, here are the options. You could ignore the problem and just say, well, uh, we're right. <laughs> or you can abandon the theory, look for a new theory. That's what Copernicus did. Um, you can modify your theory slightly, like Kepler did, or like Ptolemy or modified the, the theory of Aristotle. Well, another option. I didn't give this to you before. You can trust the theory and deduce that there was some unknown factor. Now, this was beautiful. This was, this was amazing. They said, Newton is right. And their, their only explanation for the incorrect or the, the difference between the measurement and the theory is there must be some other planet disturbing things out there. And this was, uh, was the right answer. In September of 1845, the English mathematician and astronomer John Couch Adams, who at that time was a college student, uh, later he uh, made a name for himself, but um, he predicted by his computations where the unknown planet would have to be in order to make Newton right and make the, the observations right, both. Uh, so he trusted the theory, but he said there's something else. Nobody listen, listened to poor John. Um, he wrote letters to the royal astronomer. He wrote letters to friends, and people just blew him off. But a year later, in Paris, the very famous and, and decorated uh, French mathematician and astronomer, Urbain Jean-Joseph Le Verrier, did the same thing. He predicted there's a planet out there. And his, his prediction agreed with Adams, and they listened to him. In fact, he had a friend in Berlin. He wrote to his friend Johann Galle, and the first clear night after the letter arrived, Galle and his team took their telescope and looked, and they found Neptune. First clear night. That was amazing. It was within one degree of the prediction. I, I just can't tell you how how amazing that is, that the prediction was confirmed so closely. In fact, uh, the, the manager of the, uh, of the observatory uh, said, this is the noblest triumph of theory. So that is, that's really a showcase of how to do science. But we are always faced by this challenge when the experiment disagrees, and it will, it keeps happening. What happens? So this was interpreted as a great confirmation that Newton has the answers. But please notice it's not proof. 
It's just confirmation. It's good. We like it. It's supporting evidence. It's not proof. Because there were further failures, the orbit of Mercury was not exactly what was predicted. Um, in fact, the ellipse keeps turning, and they scratched their heads for a long time, and they couldn't figure out an explanation. Um, there were other things that kind of challenged the model, and in fact, ultimately, this proved the model was wrong and it's the death knell. What Newton called a universal law is not even true. Far from universal, far from being a law, it's false. It's a good first approximation. But we have replaced it. In 1916, Albert Einstein presented the theory of general relativity. Again, this was my area of study, and uh, it's amazing. In just a couple of words, there is no force of gravity. There is warping of space-time. You put a big mass here, it warps things. Put a big bowling ball on your trampoline, and then it, you'll see a dip on the surface. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about, a deformation of space and time so that as something tries to go straight, it will curve. And uh, this image shows exactly that. The sun is deforming space near it. Anything that's trying to go straight ends up circling around, right? It's orbiting. Even light will bend when it comes near the sun. It's a better model, but is it true? I hope you now will answer, mm, we, we, don't have, we don't have confidence that it's true. In fact, we know it's wrong already because at the small scale, we need quantum physics general relativity is not enough. Man, we're finding so much that we don't know. It teaches us humility. Quantum physics is also an approximation to the truth. It's not the truth. There are other models that might replace it someday, like string theory, supersymmetry, loop quantum gravity. We don't know. We're going to keep testing our theories and trying them. So just some take-home lessons. Science is inadequate to find truth. It's tentative. It's limited. There's no guarantee here. Errors in the past? Well, I should actually expect some errors in the future. I have no reason to believe that we have all the answers today. I actually think that some things we'll never even think to try until eternity. We'll have, we'll have time. But our current explanations are probably approximately correct. I'll use them, they're, they're powerful. But I won't say, oh, this causes me to disbelieve in God because of a tentative model? No, thank you. So God bless science. If, you, if I were to refuse to practice science, I would be refusing a gift of the Creator. But in fact, um, He made us curious. He made us want to know. He made us this way to... Uh, Exhibit curiosity, creativity, careful, concentrated, cogitation. And if you can think of another C word to put in there, please tell me. Uh, so this is the way God wants us to treat his creation. But science is inadequate to guarantee that we've found truth. That's the limitation I'm talking about. Okay, so... Um, Relying on science to find the true nature of reality is hopeless. So let's quick look at a biblical worldview in contrast. As we start from the Bible and the explanation of God that's presented there, a, a one God, not multiple squabbling gods, one God who created a universe that shows order. This really is why science developed. In fact, I would say science comes out of the biblical worldview instead of being against it. We'll, um, we could go into a lot more detail there, but we understand because God created the universe and because God created us. And, uh, for instance, Francis Schaeffer has written about this. The Bible taught that there is a reasonable God who had created a reasonable universe, and thus man, by use of his reason, could find out the universe's form. I'll tell you tomorrow, I went through a period of agnosticism, and I doubted 
that God existed. I sometimes talked to him still, but I doubted that he was listening or that he was there. It wasn't until I went back and did a careful study for myself instead of taking other people's word for things, and I read The Great Controversy, I read Ellen White, and I read Francis Schaeffer, and I began to see the biblical worldview presents a coherent, consistent, logical explanation that I don't get otherwise. More on that tomorrow. But um, it also teaches us humility, the biblical worldview, and I've said this several times, but the Creator is infinite, eternal, and maybe the universe is too hard for me. But even if He made me able to understand the laws of nature, um, let's admit that my understanding is, is partial. And our main, our main reaction as we do science, as we look at the universe, as we look at the night sky, it should be awe and delight. It's worship. It's examining the divine masterworks. We enjoy the wonders of the universe, and we get deeper and deeper understanding. Kepler said this, and I think we should uh, speak with him. We should uh, say the same. I feel carried away and possessed by an unutterable rapture over the divine spectacle of heavenly harmony. He sees God as, a, as an architect who has created the universe. King David in the Psalms, in Psalm 19.1, says the heavens are telling the glory of God. The expanse is declaring the work of his hands. And Ellen White says in Great Controversy, the acquirement of knowledge, this is in the new earth, in the remade uh, new, new heavens and earth, the acquirement of knowledge will not weary the mind or exhaust the energies. Still there will arise new heights to surmount, new wonders to admire, new truths to comprehend. Upon all things, from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written. And throughout all the years of eternity, as they roll, will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and Christ. And that is my prayer. I would say, as students of science, as, as we study God's creation, although we're seeing through a glass darkly, heaven can begin now. Thank you for coming out this evening. Let's have a prayer. Lord, we stand in awe. We are amazed at your greatness. And just as we enjoy looking at art on earth and appreciate the talents of the artist, maybe we don't see how that could be. We, we don't have that talent necessarily, but we appreciate it. And we, when we look at your artwork, your creation, we thank you. We also thank you for putting us here. We thank you for what you, have, what you have done in us and what you promise to do through us to improve the lives of those around us. Help us to be your hands. Help us to be open to your spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.